card. Okay. Okay, I think probably we'll ask you if I, you need to record or something. I think we did. It says recording. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to start out. I'm just going to give a little introduction. Um, and then, you know, we can get started. Okay, I count down here. Four, three, two, one. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the first edition of the Five Points International Interview, where we're interviewing movers and shakers around the African world. Want to welcome our first, very first guest here today with us, the Honorable Yadi Bozia. Thank you, thank you. Yes. I'm so honored to be your first guest in any, you know, it doesn't matter how, um, if I came first or last, that would be an honor because I really like your work and, um, I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. Well, it's really great to be in conversation with you. Um, to start out with, for those who don't know you, maybe you give yourself a little introduction, where you come from, that sort of thing. Well, I, 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 I was born in Ethiopia um, and on the place called Oromia, where the central part of Ethiopia, which um, um, the biggest ethnic group in Ethiopia was Oromia. So I, I was, I grew up in there. I, I lived in the capital city after that. Um, and when I was two, my uh, family was involved in politics and my father died when I was two years old. So um, because of politics. So I left uh, my hometown and moved to the capital city. That's where I grew up until I come to United States in 1995. So. <clears throat> that be that makes twenty six years now it's in, in 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 America I think so twenty five years so so I live most of my life here now um, it's kind of crazy to think about it that way but that's what happened wow wow so tell me about um about your father what activities what was his uh, career and I know he was a great man who influenced a lot of people. Yeah, um, um, he was a very famous person in his uh, neighborhood and his uh, city and the country and the place he lived. Um, what he was used to own properties, he used to, um, you know, involve in, in local things. But then he ran for the parliament representing um, the uh, Mecha area, which is a small, um, it's like basically it's like. Congress, like so. Well, um, Congress, like so. You represent um, people that are around your your thing. So basically, he ran for a parliament, and he won three consecutive parliament seats for four years. So twelve years he was in the parliament, where is Haile Selassie's parliament. So mm -hmm. he used to live in the capital city and uh, um, into his home. But at the same time, he was working with the uh, royal uh, uh, parliament, representing the people. So he was known for fighting for farmers' rights and for land rights, for education, and things like that. Um, one of the most important parts of that time was the country was following a feudal system mm -hmm. in which like, uh, landowners divide their lands from the farmers, and the farmers will keep one side of the, the crop and give two thirds of the crop to the uh, landowners and landowners shared that with the church. That was basically the system that was laid out. It was not a sustainable system. It was really hard on the farmers. Um, mm -hmm. And it was actually the, uh, if you really study more about Ethiopian history, uh, one of the reasons why the, uh, the crown is not, is kind of um, the system of the crown system in the country was stop because of the extreme poverty that bring to the ordinary farmers in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people mm -hmm. in the Western don't like understand that history, like uh, maybe it's intentional, I don't know, but um, the, the revolution that started in the country is not because of political issues or is not because they didn't like what the, the, you know, the king uh, was doing at that time politically, it's more about socially, like economical and um, 
that's what caused most of the the rift between the people and the the the, 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 the dynasty at that time or the monarchy I, I have to say not dynasty monarchy mm -hmm. and my father was known for speaking his mind at that time and there was a couple of uh, newspaper clips i have here where he sometimes walk away from the parliament in anger because um the the way the system was laid out there was a king and there was a lot of um small kings from every department uh area and then there was a lot of um when the hierarchy goes down like so when you see, hear things like now people uh talk about it in the time of endearment ras barambaras or kenya's match grass match all of these kinds of ranks at that time and these ranks will give you a certain amount of ownership on land or who, how many people you 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 control and there was a lot of disagreements and at their time that the system is not sustainable and these people on top will keep on grabbing and hoarding land, hoarding land and taking land from the farmers and people are really being starved at that time. And um, he was going through a lot of uh, discomfort with that. Um, mind you, he was also a landowner. So he was also in the system, but at the same time, he, well, he knew the system was not sustainable. Um, and, um, Excuse me, uh, and um, he actually spoke about that, but that's not the reason why he died. And the government changed to socialist government. They start looking for uh, people who used to be landowners and they start killing them. And my father is one of the people who refused to do that. So there were gunfire and that's how he's killed. A lot of people died, including my brother, younger brother, and uh, our neighbors. And the story goes even deeper and deeper. Um, mm -hmm. I can like write a movie out of it to tell you the truth uh, because we still have the land and the house was, they bring like tanks and artillery to our home and just burn our house and um, they didn't let us to, you know, uh, bury our father for like 17 years. It took 17 years for me to wait to, um, so basically my father died when I was two, I buried him when I was 19. So that's how crazy it was. So uh, it's heavy, it's it's heavy. the same kind of uh, anger and the same kind of extreme meanness and, um, and crime is coming back again. I see the same thing. That's why you see me talking more about, um, you know, it was all this anger that targeting on me. I, I just cannot sleep well knowing that we're repeating the same thing again. Um, so there is, um, one thing that Japanese do is like they support something to to far extreme or they hate something to far extreme. There's no middle ground. And I don't know why. Don't know why. So that's what's happening right now. That's what's happening. Interesting, interesting. Well I'm um, just back we'll, we'll return to your um to to what you were analyzing with the history politically and everything a little bit later, but I just wanted to also talk about your coming to the states and your artistic training, um, your your first artistic influences, and then how that led to you, you know, being in a professional artist and everything. That's a very good question. I actually, um, my first love is music. A lot of people uh, don't um, they they know me from see that a, a group of people that know me from visual arts because I do a lot of painting that you already know. And I did a lot of shows, and my work is collected with different people. So they know me through that work. And there are people who know me by design, because I'm by trade, I'm a designer. And I work for the University of Washington, and also I designed the African Union flag. And all of those things, um, they know me in that. And there are people who know me with music, too. So, But for me, like music is the anchor, like the, that something that holds all of it for me. You know, like I started music. Um, music was, I, I have just had a hard life when I was a little kid. I was struggling with a lot of things, trying to make sense of what happened to my family. And most of my brothers and sisters lived a very good life. I lived the poor life because I, we lost everything and we fled to the city and with nobody after I was born. So I was in struggle even to like pay for ordinary things. Like, so. 
for me, music was like um, a place to escape. Like I sing about things and I, um, I just find it to be my friend. You know? So it was not even, and music was not even for any other external purposes. So that like, keep me sane. So I sing about things and you know. So the music is what inspired me to, because I see how powerful the art is by itself. So for me, I don't separate design or painting or music because they all seem the same to me. Like I, I painting is like a, like a, a graphic form of music for me. Like I can definitely, if I paint my, my sorrow away or my anger away or my happiness away, or it's the same thing with music. So music is my, my, my first love and I always look into better, in a funny way, music is not what I'm more famous, famous for, but you know, um, as you already know, good music um, is not judged by how many people listen to it or buy it or anything like that. But it's about the, the voice that we, that the message that we carry. So I never even cared about if my music is played in the bar or the club or if it was popping. I, I, I cared about if my music speak the truth. And sometimes I get letters from people that are touched by it. I, you know, I remember one time I was in Ethiopia when I went back two years ago. I ran into this guy on a hallway and the guy, um, you know, that exactly African way, you know, here there's that pleasant way of saying hello. In Africa, people just pass you. They don't, they, you know, they, they, don't, they have no time for it. To make yeah. <laughs> so the guy just passed me and you know, I, I just passed him. And then I um, I was in an interview place. I did an interview and came out. And then he came out again from his office. And then um, some guy told him, you know, do you know this guy? And he's like, no, I don't know. Who, who's this guy? You know, and they told him, this guy's Yadi. And, and he just flipped. And he showed me his phone profile. It was uh, um, one of my music is his his phone profile, <laughs> and he said this song spoke everything I wanted to say, and that's why I keep it like this. And so he just freaked out because uh, my point is I, the reason why I bring that story not to show you that um, about myself, but about the power of music and mm -hmm. how it can try. Like I was not even sure people know me in that city. Let alone mm -hmm. anything, but the music penetrated. The music went in there and touched that person's life. So it's a very powerful thing, and I think you know that more than anybody else. That, um, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I like how you talk about it all being one thing. You're a creative person, and you create. It sounds like. Yeah, that's yeah. how far I do. You know, like I, for me, it's about if the idea came, I can use painting or drowing or, or music are still the same thing. I can just communicate through those things. Mm -hmm. Wow. So um, what, what um, did you take any music courses coming up, growing up, or just came to it? No, I did not take any music courses. I um, don't have any skill to play instruments, um, mm -hmm. but I can, naturally, I can understand music. This is weird to say. Like if you ask me a key or something, I might look really, I don't know what I'm talking about because I mm. cannot study music. But mm. I understand, like, for example, when I work with Regina Taylor Irway, uh, mm -hmm. one of the, he's very talented. He's very smart in music. And I just mm. always know how, of how, what he can give me in music. But he's always say like, when I get the music and listen to it, I know how to write on top of it. I know how yeah. to um, understand the beats. And, and so when we meet again to record or to look through, I go through every single one of them without a problem. It's just naturally, I think I'm, I, can, I can sense the music. Um, mm. I think you probably relate to this. And a lot of times I go to concerts and just left because uh, I see like a lot of uh, problems in music or the timing is off or something. A lot mm. of people are just having a good time, but I just cannot stand it. Um, yeah. it's usually what's the curse of being a musician. So I'm not, yeah. I, I did not study music. I study art, uh, the, the craft. I have a couple of degrees in that, but I did not mm -hmm. study music. Mm -hmm. And I want to, but I'm just not 
then life do not allow it yet. Well, you still have time. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, what about your your art training? What uh, what what did you study specifically? What are your degrees in? Well, I um, I studied uh, graphic design in Seattle Central uh, Academy here, um, and I got a, uh, an AA degree for, for that. So, very extensive graphic design program, which includes you know the entire craft of designing, color theory, mm -hmm. and all those things. And then I went to Seattle Pacific University and studied visual graphic, uh, visual uh, communication, which is mostly the bigger, uh, broad sense of it. So basically, mm -hmm. it's about marketing and you know, how to market things, how to do campaigns and things like that. And I got a BA in that. Um, I also, in a crazy way, I went to Ethiopia and college and studied accounting, which have nothing to do with me, but I have a degree in accounting. Um, mm -hmm. In Ethiopia, when um, when I was there, the government would give you a national exam, and that national exam will put you in a placement for different schools. Mm -hmm. So I passed the exam; like I got like three point two or three point two, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. which is good result. And then mm -hmm. they and I applied for to get into architectural school. And I, I got accepted in architectural school. I was so happy to get into architectural school. The government sent me there and I went there. And out of all the classmates that were there, the dean came and grabbed me and took me out of the classroom. He said, you're not gonna be an architect. And I'm like, what? He said, no, you, you, you must result was C. We don't accept students like that. He just threw me out, rude, rude person. Um, and just like that, my, my vision of being an architect just died. So this is exactly how some of the problems in Africa, like um, there are painful moments that I remembered and it was like, wow, that was exactly one of them. And I was just, what am I gonna do now? So I went to the government office and they said, no, you have to be an accountant now. And I'm like, I don't wanna be an accountant. They're like, well, you don't, if you don't wanna be an accountant, go home, you know, I'm no school. And I went home and they're like, what do you want to do? So you just take the class. So I just went in there and ended up being an accountant, but I was not interested in it. Yeah. So, uh, but the good thing about that is after I graduated, I refused to work on it. Even if I got some jobs and stuff, I did not want to pursue it because I knew even at that time that unless you like something, it's just a painful thing to do. So I just said, no, I can't do it. So, so when I come to the United States, I actually um, used um, my, I just completely removed that from my life and go back to school and restart again. Um, so I never even talked about that because first of all, there's painful things I shared with it. The only thing I got is maybe some magazine here when I graduated, the photo, and that's it, that's the only thing I gave for it. I never even cared for accounting, but another interesting story but yeah that's how but that's how i, I studied two um uh, two places in seattle that gave me a good skill to go out and do art and painting and design and things like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow that's a great story man um so how did it um come about that you designed the african union flag how did those that series of of events lead to you being the designer well, um, I think I was working one day and I got some um, like newspaper ad or something that says African Union wants the world designers to participate in this. And, and then I said, okay. And I looked into it um, and I read the requirements. The requirements are clear and they were written by um, African Union leaders, like what mm -hmm. they're looking for, like they're looking for ideas and, um, and they wanted to see something that unite the, 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 the African. And it was kind of vague, but then I, I, I took it and I said, I am, gonna, I am gonna design something that I feel like is gonna be good for Africa. So I spent most of my time just thinking about the design, not the design stuff. So I was thinking about like, what is Africa? Because when I was in Africa, 
I saw uh, a lot of African countries were, um, they, first of all, they went through colonization, as you know. Um, almost all African countries, except I mean, two countries, Ethiopia and Liberia, I think, that not colonized, quote unquote. Even that is, um, is hard to accept in some cases because even if the colonization did not happen, the effect of colonization is still around them. You know, what I'm trying to say is these countries still influence the, the neighboring countries and the governments and local governments. In Ethiopia, for example, most of the uh, clash, the ethnicity and things like that, that people are talking about, it's just not happened uh, an accident. They are like a timing bomb that was planted a long time ago when English was around. Uh, now all African countries, like even France, this is the kind of thing they're known for and leaving those uh, bombs that explode like 100 years later. And mm -hmm. that's what we're dealing with. But a lot of Africans don't, um, you know, they understand it, but African leaders are not really understanding these things. And they, uh, they're making errors after error because of not understanding the past history. Anyway, so I was thinking about those things and I said, um, maybe we have to have an Africa that completely reinvents itself from that past colonial system. Something that comes out, like a new dawn for Africa, a new day for Africa. Um, because every time Africans are defined in their anger towards the colonial system or um, that's always included in that. So I feel like one way of winning is completely putting that behind you, trying to emerge as a new um, continent. So that's what's thinking my, my mind. So when I write the design brief, I wrote that thing in detail. So if you, if you remember the design, the flag in the back and the light, the sun um, and the stars, the representation, all is just to give that clear, um, like a um, tabula rasa, like the new canvas to Africa, mm -hmm. where we can start to look ahead, not look back, because looking back is usually have a lot of painful memories. Um, and so that's what I, I, I wrote uh, in, in the design brief, and then I designed it and sent it to them. And I didn't have anything for three years. Wow. I didn't have anything. I actually told that's just completely lost i really forgot what i'm telling the truth because i thought it was lost already mm -hmm. but then one day i was um having my second kid isaiah uh becca was my first daughter was a year and a half isaiah was like maybe two or three months and i was carrying in those carriers that you carry in the front and i was watching news and gaddafi Colonel gaddafi came to america for the first time because he was under uh, embargo and they didn't want him to fly to the United States. And then finally they decided to let him fly. Uh, and if you remember, he did not able to find a place to stay and he rented Trump's house, if you remember. Mm -hmm. Trump is the one who gave him uh, his land so he can erect a tent. Um, <laughs> it was interesting to think about it now. Um, I forgot about that, yeah. Yeah, I know. So when he came in, um, he sat the interview with uh, Larry King. And yeah. that, that interview was interesting. So I wanted to watch the interview. So I uh, turned on the TV. And then behind him, there is this flag that I designed. <laughs> so I start, I'm like, I'm like, am I crazy? Or is that the flag I designed? <laughs> And then I said, okay, I have to go check this. And then I came back to my office, opened the computer, find the design, looked at it, went back and looked at it. And I'm like, <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> wow. So uh, I freaked out because I'm like, okay, they, they either adapted and did not tell me because it's already behind them. It's like, this is on the flag. Yeah, yeah. And, or, they, like if I Google like um, African Union, um, uh, Gaddafi, Larry King, I can show you right now. Uh, yeah. um, anyways, so I looked at it and I said, is this like, am I crazy or this is the flag? Here, here is the, so here, look, look. so that's, 
that's a flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I'm like, so I called um, African Union and then said, hello, who's this? And I said, my name is Yadi Yadi. And they're like, what are you talking about? We don't know anything about this. And I said, well, I sent a, a design and the design was on TV. And is there any news? And she's like, look, all these flag things are, only handled by presidents. They called it the assembly um, and the head of state's assembly. So we don't know anything about this. You need to sit tight and we don't know anything. Um, and then I'm like, okay, and I just hung up. Four months passed after that. And then I get a letter. And the letter said, you know, the leaders um, adapted the flag to be the African Union flag and you need to be coming to Ethiopia as soon as possible. That's what it says. Yeah. So I, um, they flew me and my family to uh, the capital city. And then we landed, <laughs> it's funny. We landed in there, not knowing what's about to hit us. Um, and I was so tired, it was like 18 hour flight, as you know. And um, I was carrying my son, I have this fed up like, um, Oh, money t-shirts that I'm wearing and uh, and I, I dropped uh, I got to the airport and then this bodyguards come and they said Mr. Boja I'm like yeah come with us and I'm like uh, I have to sleep they're like no 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 you have to come with us they're waiting for you took me to um, African Union I was walking the whole way trying to get a password a part, like an ID card for the next day of the conference for me and my wife, because I have to sit with the president, so I have to have the badge and everything, right? Mm -hmm. so, I, <laughs> so I was walking the hallway. I swear to God, I bumped, right when I came in like this, I bumped into Gaddafi in his entire entourage, right, in the hallway. And mm -hmm. I just froze in there. I'm like, what uh -huh. is happening? And then, uh -huh. and then they just passed me, just like normal people, and they all like the cameras and everything is flashing. They just passed me. And then I'm like, I stood there. I'm like, am I dreaming? And then I turned around. The Ethiopian Prime Minister, Mullah, which is a very powerful person at that time, he came and they passed me too. And then now they keep on passing me because I was in the hallway of this small conference room. Yeah. yeah. I came home and I told my wife and she's like, you must be crazy. And then I was, I have, I have this small uh, video recorder in my hand and I was recording and then one guy came to me and he said, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just recording. He's like, he's, he's not even looking at me. He's looking over there telling me, right. please put that in your pocket, please. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. And I put it back in my pocket. <laughs> the last time I took that camera, I was there. Anyways, <laughs> the next day we um, uh, we officially went there. They gave us all the respect. They sat me beside like I remember sitting like with presidents, and for three days um, I stood by them, all fifty presidents, including the United Nations head, and me stood there and put the flag up. And it is, it is, it is actually a hist part of history that is incredibly unimaginable. Like I cannot able to uh, put it back in there because all these people are killed. Some of them are dead. Uh, like the prime minister at that time, which is really uh, uh, gave me a good uh, invite. Uh, he died in Malaysia uh, now. Gaddafi died. Um, a lot of people from there were not around. not around. And also I see like the first black president from America went to Ethiopia and stood behind the flag and make a speech uh, to the wow. world. Um, so the history is like, keep on making itself. Every time I see it in Olympics, I see it in World Cups and everything like that. And um, it is, I don't know how it happened to me, but it is something that actually put me on top. I think you are, um, you are, I think you are um, mute. Okay, yeah, I unmuted myself, yeah. Okay, okay go um, ahead. 
Mm-hmm. Now, so that's what the story of African Union looks like. Wow. Yeah, that, <laughs> that by itself is a whole movie. I'm telling you, it's, it's really, mm-hmm. I, sometimes when I think about it, um, it's just, um, it's really, it's really interesting how um, a person, I am nobody, like a year, if you really think about it, I delivered pizza. I drove cars to help mm-hmm. support myself from the school. I and then, and then all of a sudden now I'm standing by, you know, world leaders. Um, it's sometimes it's very interesting. The story not even captured in Western media because they don't even know what the magnitude of the flag means to Africans. Um, no. And uh, and like you, you like people not even know anything about it. But but it's really it continues still to this day. It continues to be history. And yes. so last time they invite me back when they um, they built a very nice statue for Haile Selassie and the grounds of African Union, and I was mm-hmm. really honored because they was they invite me to uh, be present in that. Um, mm-hmm. And also when they opened the statue, they were playing my music, which is me and Erase music, African Union. It was completely in play again and again, national TV, and it was just touching. Um, mm-hmm. I was with the family in there. Um, I have um, a lot of respect to what Haile Selassie did to African Union. Um, I'm always um, a, a, an observer of people's legacies. There is a lot of things that I disagreed with in Haile Selassie time and some of the mistakes that I think is made. And I don't afraid to share those or to speak about them. But I also believe in keeping people's legacy intact. Uh, because I believe in keeping the good and denouncing the bad is what takes us to the next level. Uh, but not like just because you hate someone, hate them all, everything about them, or because you love them, just put them on the pedestal and not talk anything bad about them. Mm-hmm. Both of them, both those approaches are not something I agree with. So mm-hmm. I, I talk about the good and I talk about the bad, but mm-hmm. not in a way to punish or but to learn from. So mm-hmm. that's how I think leadership has to be. Uh, I have. To, I think we have to learn from our past. Um, and as I think the past problems and miseries and um, and problems also teach us things to make our life better. Unless we learn from those, we keep on repeating the same thing. So we need to focus on those things, and that's what I'm doing right now here. When I talk about um, the prime minister. Um, and how he's uh, making a lot of errors. Um, and people just get angry at me, and I'm like, no, I look, if I really respect this person to be somebody, I have to point out his problems so he can fix them. But mm-hmm. that's not how they talk about them. That's not how they think about things. They just wanted to tell you, like, oh, he's a Nobel Peace Prize winner, so we, he's, he's God given. I'm like, it means nothing. Mm-hmm. It means nothing unless it means something to a person on the, uh, you know, in the country with a poor person, unless there is something that tangible thing they did for these people, the rest have nothing to do with, with who you are. Like, it doesn't matter how many diplomas or degrees you hang on the wall, it doesn't matter how many accolades they gave you, unless you do something that really touch people in a positive way, it's all lost. That's all I'm, I, that's my belief. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. continue to be my belief and continue to be what caused me a lot of grief and pain is because I, I see people refuse to point out problems uh, mm-hmm. and then repeat the same errors after error after error, you know. So, mm-hmm. so, so that's, that's why I'm like, you know, okay, do that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the duty of the artist is to point out the reality of the situation to the people. You exactly. Know? exactly. That's, that's all of our duty, you know, no matter who we are, if we're creative, you know, that's what we're called on to use our creative talents for, to talk about the reality. So yeah, respect to that. So um, yeah, you know, and I see, you know, I follow on Twitter, I follow you on Twitter and I follow a lot of people uh, now in Tigray and in Ethiopia too. And what is always amazing to me is to see the, the, the vast difference between what people, who have relatives in Tigray are talking about on Twitter, you know, and then what Abi is talking about on his account 
it's like the war is over, everything's fine. Um, you know, it's it's crazy to me. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. That's exactly what I'm I actually was alluded to earlier. Uh, the fact that the Ethiopian political landscape is always uh, divided into two polar opposites. So like, when you see like Abi Iswan, everything is fine. The country is growing. Things are going great. And then you look at the Tigrayan people who are against the war, you'll see them talking about uh, refugees, people being killed, all those things. But what upset me about this thing is like, there is not a whole lot in the middle that can actually talk about what's really happening. Like, um, we know for sure things are not okay. So we know for sure the prime minister is not telling the truth. That's just for sure, because people are dying. He came to the parliament and he said, we control the capital city with zero people dying, he said. He said, zero people died. And there are photos of his generals under a dead body. Like, I'm like, how are you even talk about this like, and make it real? And people not even asking this a very important question. And then at the same time, the, the problem is this. It's a constant chain of problems. The people from Tigray also missed an opportunity when the time they supposed to speak about other human rights violations, they did not do that. So again, the same circle of error that I'm talking about. Basically, why can't we have a decency to speak the truth when we see it. Mm -hmm. uh, in Ethiopia, uh, let's say you are um, a party member for PP, which is Prosperity Party, which Abi is leading, right? Yeah. Anything you do have to be saying nice things about PP. If you say mm -hmm. anything, mm -hmm. I'm talking about even to the slightest, mm -hmm. criticize anything, you're going to be in jail, you're going to be kicked out, you're going to be the enemy. Mm -hmm. So they have to be lying, just making the same kind of errors he was making. But for people who are living in a democratic land, like, like the so-called free land from Ethiopian rifles, I'm talking about, um, like United States, you live in the United States, the government cannot touch you, right? You have to have a decency to speak the truth. But they don't do that. Kind of but... Um, and also, that's why Ethiopian presidents and Ethiopian leaders find themselves completely in the bubble and get into this shock when they are overthrown because they believe their own hype. They believe yeah. their own you know, BS. And then they're like, everything is good. I'm telling you, when I was young and uh, uh, Tigray and rebels are controlling the city, they came so close to the city, we can hear the guns. We can hear the gun uh, from like 50 kilometers, 10 kilometers. We can see it, right? But the local officials were telling us how life is great and how, and then within like days, we see them arrested. Like, it's like, how? I remember one time I'm, I'm asking the person, saying like, how can you lie to yourself like that? It's, it's just the way it is. I don't know why that is, but um, it's sad what's happening. But at the mean, in the meantime, a lot of people are dying and being uh, fled from their country. The displacement, there is a post that I made. That I made. There was millions of people displaced in Ethiopia in the past two years. Millions of people. Um, there were hundreds of major... Um, skirmishes that cost life. 20 people here, 50 people there, 30, hundreds of them happened in these two years. And mm -hmm. they're still talking about them as nothing is happening. So I don't know how we can continue doing this, but um, mm -hmm. the only thing I can do is just talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, you know, um, and thank you for that because it's, you know, we don't really see that perspective, but I see that you're talking about the two extremes. Like when I look at the Twitter feed again, you know, of Abi, you know, he talking about, uh, 
it's a law and order action that he's doing and they're looking for the criminal clique. He uses all these code words and it's always the same word, the criminal clique, law and order. Junta, things like that. Yeah, it's it's amazing to me. Um, you know, I've oh. never been to Gray, but it's amazing. Go ahead. Look, the the the, the people of the Gray are innocent. They are poor people like the people of Oromo, people of Amara, anywhere you go. Yeah. The TPLF is a political party. They are uh, they run the country for 30 years. They used to run, I, I used to work for them. See, the, the thing people don't understand is when these cliques and juntas, he called them, he used to be the head of a spy. Yeah. He used to basically look in people's laptops and phones and make people like, he's basically the eye and ear of the, the administration that killed a lot of people. Yeah. And so what I'm saying is this, if we start talking about how bad they were, let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Where were you? Mm -hmm. He was a minister under the administration. Mm -hmm. He ran the the head of the, the spy agency, INSA. Mm -hmm. He actually brags in one of his videos how he made it so complicated so he can track people's phones and, um, you know, and install cameras of those stick. Like he was, there is a video out there, him talking about how the technology can be used to do a lot of great things. Hmm. But today, he was telling us how bad they were. And I have a hard time with that. My heart, you know, like, you're not some angels that fought with somebody and win and came here. You were the one who were looking for. And now you're like, you pick them up because of their ethnicity and go after them. Mm -hmm. And that's just not sitting right, right? Because um, I, at the time when T, TPLF and EPRDF, which is the party that, they're trying to hit right now, was running the country. Mm -hmm. I was writing continuously about the human rights violation that happened. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of human rights violations that committed. At the same time, they did a lot of great things in the country. Infrastructure building, road construction, um, uh, electrical power, uh, life, that I was just having a show uh, that the life expectancy when they took power was 43 years old. Like, people can live only 43. When they're removed from power, the life expectancy was 63 years old. And they, that's a quite an amazing change they made. The, uh, the gross national income for one person was like $200 when they took power. And when they left, it was 850, four, four fold. And like the, the country's domestic product was 7 billion when they took power. When they left, it was 196 billion, which is a lot for Ethiopia, it was 14 fold. So mm -hmm. there are numbers that mm -hmm. show these people actually did great things. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they violated a lot of human rights. They, there was a lot of land grabs and which caused them to be uh, out of power. But once they're out of power, you don't have to chase them again because they already left the country and went north. So why mm -hmm. are you going over there and try to change them when they are in their country and the mm -hmm. people who voted for them voted, like 90 some percent of people voted for them. So who are you from the capital city to go over there and install a new leadership mm -hmm. over there? So it is very interesting and very complicated at the same time. But for, for some of us who are watching it very closely, it's so hard to swallow because we know the people that, that they're telling us to hate these people are those people themselves. Yes, yes. Like the, the prime minister, the vice prime minister right now, uh, he's also the, uh, the speaker of the um, secretary of state right now. Um, he have a speech that I looked at while he was waving their flag, he was, making a speech saying how wonderful these people are, they give us our freedom, two or three years ago. And now he's saying these people are cliques, 
you have to have $10 million if you bring them here. I'm like, why are you, like, it's very hard to swallow for, for, for a work person who understood the politics. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just kind of hard to swallow because you know they are the same people. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. That's amazing. So that's, that's the thing, you know, that's, that's the thing we're struggling with. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're uh, bad people or, uh, but if they are bad, you're bad too. You're yeah. the same. You're the same. You know? mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like they're manipulating the people um, and trying to pull the wool over their eyes to continue their quest for ultimate power. Yeah. And the one thing they used is the hate towards that ethnicity. Yeah. Because yeah. that is a bone they throw to a lot of people in the center. Because mm -hmm. the people in the center hated the Tigrayans because they run the country for 30 years. There were a lot of Tigrayans in high places and they start making this money and they start building big buildings and stuff. There was a lot of anger and jealousy, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. and resentment towards stuff. And then when they leave and they go north, they use that ethnicity as a way to show how bad these people are. That's why they're doing a lot of racial profiling now. They fire people yeah. from everywhere. They, I heard, uh, yeah, they they actually go after people's bank account, like old people. Um, I have um, a banker from Ethiopia who um, we used to give this lady like a social security money. It's like a retirement kind of money, and she's from Tigray, and she used to come to his bank all the time. Right? He always has this small talk with her and laugh with her and give her money, she goes back. And then one day they passed this law to froze her account because she was born in Tigray. And the guy went into social media and wrote, he said, I hate that I'm Ethiopian today. He wrote yeah. his entire story. And he yeah. said, I cannot justify this because this is a sweet old lady that I've been helping for almost all my entire life. And now I will tell her while she's crying that I can't give her her retirement money because wow. she didn't even know that her bank account was open in Tigray. That's how old she lived in the capital city. Yeah, but yeah. that's what we're seeing right now. And it gets, it gets so bad and not some people, people with moral value have to speak again, regardless of what they did in the past because this is not the way to go. And that's what he's doing right now. That's why we're speaking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. So, you know, when I look at um, when Abi first came to power and, you know, they, they threw the Nobel Peace Prize at him and then, you know, we were told that it was because of the um, reforms that he was making and because he was making, had made peace with Afwerki and Eritrea and everything. But now, I'm hearing these reports of Eritrean troops and Eritreans crossing over to Tigray and, and looting churches and destroying mosques and all these things. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, that's one of the very, very interesting uh, part of this war and how Abi um, joined the foreign country, which is Eritrea, even if they're close to Ethiopia they're still a foreign country because they're not, mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're a country by themselves. Mm -hmm. And joined other countries and attack his own people. That's mm -hmm. what's the craziest part about all of this. Um, Abi won the Nobel Prize for the peace to, with uh, Eritrea, but none of the things that he, he signed with Eritrea came to fruition. That they're not even used on the ground. Why? Because the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea started because there's two major areas called Zarambasa and Badme. So Badme is a land that was considered in the northern part of Ethiopia and the southern part of Eritrea, Zarambasa. Mm -hmm. So the skirmish happened at that time and then the TPLF led Ethiopian government went and destroyed Eritrea, like they, they win the war in, like in days. And they even went to replace him, but the, pre the prime minister at that time did not want to be um, in that, so he pulled his army back. 
So they mm-hmm. controlled Zarambasa and Badme and protected that area. And they went to the International uh, United Nations. Um, at that time, the world, um, the negotiation in Morocco, I think, Morocco, Algiers, in Algiers, they decided to give Barme to Eritrea and Zarambasa to Ethiopia, right? But Ethiopian prime minister at that time refused to give both lands and they controlled both lands. It is a clear army post. That's why all these military weapons travel from the capital city, from the middle of the country to the north to protect those lands. Mm-hmm. That was the war of Eritrea and the result of it. So when he signed a deal, he signed a deal to open the border, right? But those borders do not open because the Tigray people refuse because if they opened it, then the Eritreans will come in and they don't want to do that. So mm-hmm. none of the things that he won the Nobel Prize for when it comes to the war with Eritrea did not come to impl- be implemented either mm-hmm. way. It's so interesting. But mm-hmm. the Eritrean prime minister have a beef with the Tigray people because of that war I just told you. So the day Abi was the prime minister, he's, uh, the, the, the time Abi was the prime minister, he announced that game is over for TPMF because he knew he joined Abi and fight them. So it was, it was a war of payback, not a war of values. So it's about mm-hmm. payback time. So it is for the, the, for the Western world, the debates, are they inside or not is for them, but for people who understood the politics, we knew they were there. Not only that they knew that they, they were actually leading the European army. In some cases that I read, uh, that uh, the top Eritrean officials also put in leadership of the Ethiopian army. And um, they were strategizing. Uh, even Abi was talking about it then. And like, when the war was happening, I was in Eritrea managing the war. He said that. So what are you doing in Eritrea managing the war? And so like, it was, it was like a, really a, a we, we all know that's true. Mm-hmm. Right. The second thing is um, that is um, a strategy because um, when he planned to attack Tigrayans, Tigrayans have three ways to go out. One is Afar on the right side. Afars mm-hmm. usually stand with the Ethiopian government. They believe in Ethiopian unity, so mostly they are towards Ethiopian choice, mm-hmm. so they, the Tigrayans cannot escape that way. Mm-hmm. The north is Eritrea. He got that part. The south is Amhara people. Yeah. He got that part. Now, the only way out for them is the Sudanese. And the yeah. Sudanese are still not sure. So that's why when the war started, they start by Sudan side. They control that part because they want to box them. Mm-hmm. Right? What's happening right now, I don't know if you hear this, but Ethiopia and, and, and Sudan are almost starting a war right now. I heard, yeah. And that is, I see it in two ways. One, it can be good news for the TPLF because the beef of Ethiopian and Eritreans, uh, Ethiopian and Sudan, means that Sudan will give a leeway to uh, TPLF to go reorganize and come back. Mm-hmm. That's what I used to, we used to fight the first military government. The Ethiopian military government will chase them out of the country mm-hmm. and these people will disappear for a couple of months, mm-hmm. rebuild themselves in and then come back and attack. Mm-hmm. The Ethiopian government did not want that. If you remember, the day before the war, Abi invited the Sudanese president, president in the country, give him a red carpet treatment, because he mm-hmm. knew if he don't hold Sudan to that friendship, they will give them a place to mm-hmm. yeah. So that's, um, the war is not a good news for Abi right now, because if they continue these skirmishes in there, anger the Sudanese, the Sudanese will pay back by joining TPLF. That's the mm-hmm. first thing. Um, mm-hmm. So the Eritrean part is very tricky because um, a lot of people in, in the inside of Ethiopia also have a problem with Eritrean. Because Eritreans killed more than like 70,000 people died in that war. And a lot mm-hmm. of people died in that war. And now the, the land is about to be given back to Eritrea. So what about the blood of those people who died? And mm-hmm. that's another 
thing that people not dealt with yet because they are driven with that high of going to war with TPLF. They did not calculate those things yet. Um, that, that they don't have a lot of cool-headed people who thinks about the long-term effect of the war in that East African area. Um, mm -hmm. But they were just rushing in to get into this war. <clears throat> the, the, one of the problems that I just described with Eritrea. The other thing is every um, administrative state have its own army, and the army was built to keep peace in that local area. But mm -hmm. right now, the Amharas crossed Tigray and attacked Tigray. And now they come back and they feel really emboldened. They want to go to Ben Shango, the next place to fight. They were asking for that. Um, so he opened the Pandora's box of mm -hmm. these um, border passing intervention mm -hmm. is between his own people. And that mm -hmm. will have a long term effect, which is going to cause um, a civil war coming to the country. And I clearly see it because they're talking about invading Ben Shangul, and guess what? Ben Shangul are dark-skinned people. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't understand this, but Ethiopians actually use colors to classify people. And mm -hmm. the Amhara leader wrote on Facebook that we showed these people how to be civilized. We showed how to people how to eat. And he wrote that on Facebook in the government account and he said, we also will teach them how to respect law and order. So it is a really annoying and really problematic way the country is going because mm -hmm. the central government is end up being a fan of winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And that caused a lot of hegemonic kind of mindset to arise back. So when people are talking about, we don't want to go back to old um, times, but they're not technically talking about the kings and queens. They're talking about the hegemonic system that was instilled at that time, which people mm -hmm. hated. That's why the mm -hmm. federalism is the way a lot of people support the country, because the federalism at least gives equal standing for people. Um, mm -hmm. But without federalism, what's going to happen is they go back to that one system which is hegemonic and creates mm -hmm. people with one language, mostly they speak Amharic, the upper hand, um, mm -hmm. and people who are speaking uh, different languages, not to be seen, being invisible, their culture being invisible, their mm -hmm. land, most of the fertile land is in the south, uh, is taken away by former lords and kings because of expansionist and history and now they want to go back and reclaim those things, it's going to cause a lot of um, a, a civil war kind of mentality in the country. It's very dangerous to identify, very mm -hmm. dangerous. And one of the biggest things that um, I feel like Abi lost and missed opportunity for him was to keep the country, look forward, and look for the, the prize on the top of the hill rather than taking us back and look our back. Because the back is, is not good for us. Yeah. That needs to be left for historians. That needs mm -hmm. to be left for people who are actually study the country. Not mm -hmm. to every politician to go back and you know, find his grandpa's shield and say, I'm going to go stab someone in the back. That's mm -hmm. not what we need to do in the country. And that's exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. Isn't one of his parents a Romo and one is Amhara? Well, uh, he's, he was told, he, we, I was told that like, he was uh, Oromo and his mother is Amhara. Um, uh -huh. And he grew up in Oromo culture. But mm -hmm. um, everything he was doing, everything he was saying is not like Oromo uh, yeah. people. So you remember that skit from Chappelle when uh, there was a black KKK? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what it reminded me of. That's just yeah. what it reminded me of. Clarence Bigsby. It's Clarence Bigsby over there. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's because the things that he was worshipping, the things that he want to happen, the way he speaks towards his own people, the disdain he have to 
uh, uh, being different. It's just, it just cannot add up. Uh, mm -hmm. But at first, it looked really beautiful when he came in. Um, he talked nicely. He like he he cheated all that. I am I was one of his biggest fans. I think if you remember, I used to mm -hmm. post about him, talk about great things about him. Mm -hmm. The first time I start seeing things change is when he start calling people names. Mm -hmm. I was very uncomfortable. But first time, um, my first aha moment was when he said he called to grand people daytime hyenas. Who? And then um, uh, try. I think the idea for him is to say like they stole a lot from the country. Now the country is in daylight, and the hyenas are still in the city. And guess what? The the minute he say that, I can show you my Facebook. I wrote saying this is not a word for speaking from a prime minister of that little country because mm -hmm. it will give every knucklehead a right a chance to use the word to call people. Just mm -hmm. like I said. And start to happen right away. People in the capital city used to go to people's houses and call them daylight and hyenas. In the cabs, in the places, whenever they hear Tigrinya people speaking people, they start calling them. And then he bring a word manga, which means uh, herd. He start or almost herds. He called mm -hmm. his own people herds. Mm -hmm. And then on one of the national um holiday celebration in the palace, he brings this girl and she sing, uh, she made a poem that says, um, Ethiopia, how can you, you know, live free when you people are like herbs? And, and a lot of people get angry. And then all of a sudden, the TV station start calling people herbs. The, every commentator used the word herb. He never stopped. He continuously bring these words, and then he continue calling the Tigray people's uh, election the Moon House. Okay, the Moon House. I'll explain to you. Called the Charak Abet. Charak Abet is like in Ethiopian cities. There was this rule: if you can build a house in one moon city, which is in one night, mm -hmm. there is a legal standing for you to own that land or that house. Mm -hmm. So people sometimes try to build a house at night and then they send application to the city. The city mm. will come and say, no, it's not approved. But yeah, that's called the Charaka house, right? Mm. So he called their election, moon election. Mm -hmm. Just like the moon house, right? Mm -hmm. So again, they start calling them this. And um, if you hear the grand people speak, they have very high pitched voice. Mm -hmm. Like they speak like my wife is from Tigray, so I know they're, mm -hmm. they're like Oromo people have a very low tone. Like when mm -hmm. they speak, they will say things like uh, uh, That's how it goes. When mm -hmm. Tigray people speak, they will speak a high pitch. They're like, Why is the book? Why? That the, 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 the yeah, yeah. high pitch tone. Mm -hmm. So he called them, um, he called them, um, you know, like how the crows speak. Yeah, he used he used them. Um, he, some of the politicians were angry about some of his doing. He called it that's a noise of a, a crow, but he was talking uh. about the high pitch language. Like so, he bringing this disrespect to the office by calling people's names, mm -hmm. and he have no limit in doing it. Um, mm. And so this kind of thing that really annoys me very much. Like, what kind of culture are you bringing to the country? Is the culture of name calling? Regardless of what all the problems Stephens have, one thing we that's going good for us is the respect towards each other. There is this hospitality. There is this uh, unregulated, unspoken truth between people of tolerance and respect. And it still mm -hmm. continues. Like if I go to my friends' house, I don't care where, where they're from. If an older person came, we stand up, let give them a seat. All of this um, Ethiopian hospitality and mannerism. It's kind of like it's like it's fading because we call them names. We don't. We're not used to those kind of things. Like, right? mm -hmm. um, and you know, he's bringing those things back to the. He's making them. Uh, what are the word I'm looking? He's making them like uh, mainstream, instead mm -hmm. of like extreme. It's like making mainstream. 
Yeah. And that's just, uh, that's just, he's, uh, I called him last time in, the, in one of my interviews. He is, um, he's the person that ate his political capital so fast, like in one year. Because he, if you remember, a year ago, he was on the top of the world winning the Nobel Peace Prize. Today, his name is mentioned with ruthlessness and war. Mm -hmm. And I don't, it's very hard for me to find the leader in the world that ate that entire political capital in one year. Like, yeah. he did not even spend it so fast, but he just did it. So, I yeah. don't know. That's crazy, yeah. I mean, when you're talking about the loss of respect in the public sphere and calling names, you know who that makes me think about is, of course, Donald Trump. You know, he's the person who plays by that playbook as well, you know, so. Actually, um, I think you mentioned a very good point. It is a political strategy that they copied from America that they use right now. For example, mm -hmm. the best example I can give you is just say a lot of false things and they will turn into truths. That's mm -hmm. just live right now happening. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like, for example, when he said things like, um, like yesterday he announced that like, he's going to give uh, people $10 million if they uh, show where the leader is hiding right now, right? Mm -hmm. But not, not knowing that a week ago he told the parliament that he uses a satellite to watch them going in the forest with their kids and wives. He didn't want to disturb the wives and the kids. That's why he's not touching them. And today he was asking, I'll give you 10 million dollars to show me where they are. We know it's a lie because it was, a week ago he told us, you would see them. So, but the, the, when that happened before, you see it in the same here too, right? Uh, just like, uh, we won the election, even if they, we know we did not want the election. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like, oh, we go to court, the court said no. And they go to Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said no. Like, uh, electoral vote, electoral votes approved. So what is next? There is also, like, never stop. And that's the kind of thing that I use in Ethiopia too. Like, if we say it, it's true. If we say it's true, it's true. That's yeah. it. Hmm. And it's very, very bad time for Ethiopian politics right now because you give a, a leader in Africa that kind of uh, power and also that kind of clear um, betrayal of the truth by itself, anything is possible. You know what I'm, what I'm saying is, um, anything is possible because, um, like uh, yesterday or two days ago, it just came out in the news and said, we killed 728 Oromos today. They announced that. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, this is my eyes? And they were showing like shooters and stuff like that. And I'm like, what kind of, do you, well, my point is this, in a Western system, at least that will have some kind of filter where um, the courts will ask, like, when did you kill them? The investigation mm -hmm. will happen. In Africa, once you give them the right, he can do anything, and yeah. nobody will ask. And it's very yeah. scary. And that's wow. the, the sad part is people who live there, they're not seeing it. They're not mm -hmm. seeing they're about to be slaughtered. And they will just like, mm -hmm. still supporting what's happening. <clears throat> I have families who disagree with me and like, leave him alone, let him do his job. Which job are you talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I don't understand. So <clears throat> hmm. it gets deeper and deeper. Back. Yeah, it's hard times, man. Seriously. Wow. So um, I wanted to pivot a little bit and, you know, talk about the situation in Seattle. I know Seattle had a lot of um, unrest over the summer. And I know issues dealing with uh, police brutality and things. How how do you see that um, from your perspective in Seattle now? What's going on there? Well, Seattle, uh, like any other city, um, are one of the most active cities when it comes to um, understanding the plight of black people, in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, Seattle, Portland stands out most on the west side. Uh, western part of the country but in seattle it boiled more because of a lot of homelessness that's happening in the country and 
there's an extreme concentration of wells in Seattle. Um, there, as you know, Microsoft is here, Amazon is here, headquarters of Amazon is here, Microsoft, Mongo, um, Nordstrom, all these big companies present in uh, Starbucks, they're present in Seattle. And they have a lot of money. And the amount of wealth that's concentrated in the city and the amount of poor people that keep on being chased out from a city or being end up being homeless, it just the contrast is really hard not it's very hard to deny. Mm -hmm. So people are faced with that constant revenue face, like you know, Amazon makes hundred million dollars today, but then half of the people are a new company is being laid off and they have nowhere to live. It just comes to um, this really uh, the contrast is not, it's very hard to accept. And mm -hmm. on top of that, the Black Lives, uh, the, the Floyd's murder and the, the COVID, because the COVID took a lot of people out of their house and the uh, city is filled with a lot of tent cities. People live in a tent. Um, and, and again, the contrast, like I told you, companies like Microsoft and Amazon and all these companies are making tons of money. And then when that hit, it just it just went to a different direction. That actually controlled um, the Capitol Hill area of the, the police station uh, make yeah. them, uh, for, a, for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. But now, I heard yesterday they were moving all the people uh, forcefully from the park yesterday. Um, mm. And um, there was, I think, a couple of 12 or 13 people, like more than that, arrested yesterday because they wanted to stop the police from taking their makeshift housing. So the people in that area are really frustrated by the protesters because they live there and they wanted their parks to walk their dogs and all those things. Yeah. But, but the people who are in the park wanted to survive and leave mm -hmm. because they have nowhere to go. I think mm -hmm. that it's someone who wanted to study the side effects of like extreme capitalism and greed and all those things can come to Seattle and see it because it's pretty interesting mm -hmm. how down the road a person can have hundreds of millions of dollars and then here we have hundreds of families mm -hmm. um, live in a tent house in extreme weather condition mm -hmm. like Seattle Center for example the city is doing the best they have these uh, scaling risk. You you know Seattle Center. I think you came to Seattle Center before, right? Mm -hmm. For mm -hmm. bumper shoe and things like that. And then mm -hmm. they use those mm -hmm. areas. Now they are makeshift housings. Um, they used to be kids skating areas and all those things. Are now makeshift houses. So um, the problem is not just about Black life. It's more. Uh, it's also more about the economical injustices. And disparities mm -hmm. of exceeding as mm -hmm. focusing on. I think the leadership missed a, a great opportunity of creating uh, low income housing in the early times. And now mm -hmm. the city is filled with these high raise, extremely expensive apartments, but the poor is being you know, pushed out of the city more and more and more and more. And mm -hmm. that's what's happening in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Wow. Hmm. World gone wrong. Oh, big time. Big time. Mm -hmm. It's just sad sometimes um, when I think about the amount of money. Like, I, I heard um, <clears throat> Microsoft um, put like $200 million like two weeks ago for the city because they felt like they make a lot of money and a lot of people are um, unemployed. So they're paying people who are not working right now to keep them going and all of that. But for me, is it comes down to, uh, I can't, I have a hard time not to call that a good thing, but at the same time, I understand, uh, people need to understand that even that is not good enough because you're making a whole lot of money and for you, it's like a chunk of change. Yeah. You yeah, know. tax write-off. I know. So why can't you make more? Like, why can't you 
um, make sure that your your brothers and sisters first taken care of, the mm. community taken care of, and then make your money. That, that's not mm. how it works. And so, yeah, as as you know, you know, having seen both cultures, you know, the individualism in America is so intense. You know, there's no, now the, even the idea that you should be responsible for your community, that you should think about others, it's it's like laughed at. You're thought of as not serious, like you're crazy, you know? Yeah. So, you know, well, the one thing that hit me, especially at that time when the city was burning and, uh, and the entire country, um, uh, I used to make this point to my uh, wife about how uh, I used to tell her, it's very hard for me to explain it right now, but um, I'm, you might get the gist of it um, if I say it right. But the, the point I'm trying to make is this. I, I felt like when the system is racist and the system is uh, ignoring and leave, leaving a lot of people behind, um, I say the, I know the burden mostly fell on the people who are pushed and the people who are discriminated against. But as I say, at the end of the day, that system is more poisonous to the, to the originators of the system more than the people who are intended to. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I was trying to make that point a lot of times and I always felt short, but, but that time clearly proved to me I was right because when I see companies cannot open their doors because people will burn them down. Uh, yeah. When I see that there is no safe place to shop, and that when I see like companies have to like close their entire production line because there are nobody come to work, or you know, when I see those things, I'm like, okay, see, this is what I was talking about. If you mm -hmm. were caring for the environment, if you caring for the people, if you create that place where diversity was celebrated, you don't have to do to board up your buildings today. Now, if you go to Seattle, it's almost like five, four months now, still boarded up. Still people cannot open their businesses. Still you cannot have that, that great shopping season is passing you by. And all that money you're supposed to make, is not, it's not happening. At the end, who is the biggest loser? Everybody lost. It's just not just that black person that worked there or the poor people that you keep on discarding like nothing. Is not mm -hmm. the only victim. You are also the victim of your own mm -hmm. hatred and, yes. and inequality. And that's mm -hmm. what I was actually saying. And it's really happening right now. Like and, and a lot of forms, the reason why we have to have equality and diversity and all those things is not just because we have to care for black people around us. It's because it's the world we leave behind for ourselves depending on how we stretch our hands and take care of the, the weakest and yes. the yes. worst among us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when you're speaking, you know, I keep hearing the, the catchphrase, well, not a catchphrase, but this, the, the phrase economic justice, yes. you know? I mean, there's so it's amazing to me how both political parties that are so much beholden to banks and the elite and Wall Street, they talk about George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. They, they, they use a lot of the emotional language, but nobody wants to talk about economic justice, land redistribution, um, you know, equity, not just equality, but equity, you know? So it's amazing how they, they tap dance around that still. I really, um, before I even uh, finish this interview with you, um, I just want to remind, because I know you, a lot of Africans are watching this show, uh, mm -hmm. is my, our African-American brothers are also need to think about investing in Africa. Because Africa is right now is a land that is open to a lot of Africans. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that a lot of Western and, and Asian people are moving and they're trying to grab the land, but um, African Union is doing an effort, and also African Americans have to make that effort and own a piece of land. It's a yeah. real, real opportunity for African Americans to own that yes. equity you're talking about. 
because yes. that land, like a lot of African brothers and sisters, African American brothers, so we moved into places like Ghana and um, other African countries. Now they start buying land or property. You can also mm -hmm. do that in Ethiopia and other places, uh, mm -hmm. and go see Africa and be a part of it, because. When I think about anywhere in the world right now, that's a place that's open for African Americans to actually own and invest their money mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. African Americans have a buying power more than the entire continent of Africa. Yes. And when I think about that, it just makes me really, really sad because that's a place for them. First of all, it's a homeland, it's a mother's land. Mm -hmm. that's, and owning that piece of land it's also owning your own history. And mm -hmm. so it's very important um, um, to do that. And I'm encouraged to see some people doing it, but I think there is a more can be done um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a higher level to make that connection with the motherland and invest in Africa and own a piece of land and develop it. And, you know, that's, that equity will turn into equity in in America too, because mm -hmm. you have a land somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the problem with you know just to wrap it up. That's really historically that's our problem as black people in America. The Chinese man comes to America. The Arab man comes to America, but he has his home village. He has his homeland. He has his his connection to his home culture. But so many of us having been disconnected, you know, through our history, you know, our connection is not a nation that we can identify with, you know, so that's really the change in our psychology that we have to make. I myself, a few years ago, I bought some land in Guinea, nice. in uh, Conakry, you nice. know, so I've been developing it slowly over time, brick by brick, you know, so, you know, it's, it's definitely something that anyone can do if you just organize yourself. And, you know, in my own case, I knew a, a good friend, a brother of mine. I knew the family. I'd been to the country a few times, you know, and so it felt natural. It was with people I trusted, you know. So I, I would just advise people to, there's actually a great talk show host I like to follow. His name is Philip Scott with the African Diaspora News Channel. And he always oh, yeah. talks about yeah, he always says, get your Africa plan. Get your Africa plan. Yeah. Well, like, if you're um, interested in um, investing in East Africa and things like that, we should definitely talk about it. I can definitely talk to people that help uh -huh. get on the land in there. Okay. But, yeah, because, look, it has happening. It's really there. Um, mm -hmm. It's not as hard as people think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that um, these African countries have to fulfill is, you know, having some transparencies, faster uh, regulations that um, breaks all these um, these bureaucracies in their in their countries. They can also do all those things and then uh, uh, and then make it available to Africans to buy land in in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I really think that's a really good investment. Um, because not only you, not only you making um, connection with motherland, you can also help people live there by developing the land. And it is not a guilt ownership; it is a love ownership where you can actually build a place or a business or a land or cultivate a farm or something that gives back to the community. So it's a win-win scenario. Um, yeah. And um, it's me, really, I, I really um, can definitely talk to people in the embassy in LA and stuff with all my travels with the government, they can still listen to me. But mm. I, I can, I really want people to think about investing in wow. African countries and, mm -hmm. you know, be a part of that African development because right now it's booming. It's it really is. booming. <laughs> so it be a part, be, that's very important. Yes. Wow. Well, this has uh, been a great uh, interview. I really appreciate your time and, you know, ending up on that hopeful note that, you know, like you say, it's booming, you know, and this is the time. So um, I want to thank you again. I just want to give you the opportunity to give your all your social links 
you know, where people can find you online. So, and also about your book as well, which we have a copy of your book here. Thank you very much. We love it, you know, so you could talk about that and then we could, we could finish it up. Well, people, um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I really enjoy music and work, the friendship. Um, so it means a lot to me that to be in the program. And I'll be honored to come back anytime you want me. So I'm here. Okay. Um, my social media contact is people find me on uh, Twitter. That is Y-A-D-D-I-B at Twitter. Yadi B is at uh, my account. Um, and also uh, my name Yadi Boja, Y-A-D-D-I uh, B-O-J-I-A is my music page. You can find me on uh, Spotify um, and Instagram. And Facebook is Yadesa Boja, Y-A-D-E-S-A. That's mm -hmm. a B-O-J-I-A is my Facebook account. Um, I usually use Facebook for more political things because I have a lot of followers in Africa too. Um, mm -hmm. Facebook might be winding down in, in Western culture, but in uh, Africa, Facebook is a really important tool. It reaches a lot of people, so that's why we keep it that way. Um, mm -hmm. And um, again, I'm really grateful. And I'm looking forward to see you in Seattle and my wife told me that, you know, she, well, last time we cooked some amazing Ethiopian food for you, now it's going to happen again. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't yeah. wait. <laughs> yep. Uh, looking forward to Looking forward to it. Okay, so I'm going to let you go now. Thank you for your time. We're going to talk soon. Uh, much love, my brother. Uh, much love. Okay. Love, love, love. <laughs>